Today's session will focus on the popular expedited procedure and the innovative early dismissal mechanism. We will be kicking off with the expedited procedure segment in the morning, followed by the early dismissal segment in the afternoon. Mr. Edmund J. Cronenberg, FCIR, FI, FSIR, Managing Partner of Brother Brothers LLP, is the chair for the expedited procedure segment of the Academy and will be moderating this segment. The teaching faculty members for this segment are Mr. Pisut Atakamo, partner of Baker and McKenzie Limited and company of president, sorry, and co-president of YTHAC. Mr. Min Nang Wu, managing director of Allen and Gladhill of Myanmar Company Limited. Ms. Jita Sachiani, partner of Herbert Smith Freehills LLP. Ms. Sitpa Savaratnam, consultant of Messrs. Tommy Thomas, and Mr. K. Luan Chan, partner of King & Spalding. In the course of the morning, we will be examining the expedited procedure mechanism from the perspectives of arbitration practitioners, tribunals, and the SIIC Secretariat. The first session on managing a case under the expedited procedure will be explored from the tribunal's perspective. A warm welcome for our moderator, Mr. Cronenberg, and the panelists, please. Thanks, Sue Anne. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us at this uh, uh, Indochina Academy. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here, and I'm, I'm very honored to be moderating this session with such esteemed speakers that you see on screen here. Um, this first session is going to be dealing with managing a case under the expedited procedure from the tribunal's perspective. Um, and we have lined up some important questions and what we'll be doing is asking some of our speakers uh, to address these questions uh, in turn. So, um, as you know, the expedited procedure is a very useful tool in the arsenal for uh, dispute resolution um, uh, at the SIAC. And we know that we can resolve a dispute fairly quickly um, uh, within six months. But how does one really get to that objective? And how does one do this in a fair uh, and just way? And this is what the, the, the speakers this morning are going to be addressing. So without further ado, if I could just um, get to the very first topic that we'll be dealing with, which is practical tips to ensure that the arbitration is concluded within six months from the date of the tribunal being constituted. Now that's uh, required under Rule 5.2D of the SIEC rules. The first question is, how do we balance the need to have the arbitration conducted expeditiously and concluded within the six-month time limit against the tribunal's duty to ensure due process? So if I could ask Luan and Min to address us on this topic. Luan. Thank you. Thank you, Edmund, and hello, everybody from uh, Los Angeles, California. Um, what is due process? I think due process is generally understood to be, you know, the requirement to treat the parties fairly and equally, and also to provide each party with a reasonable opportunity to uh, be heard or present its case. And any due process analysis, uh, I think, should start with the premise that the parties have willfully agreed to the CF rules that contain the expedited procedure provisions. I think that's very important because the goal of, of expedited procedure is to save time and cost, as Edmund has mentioned, within a fast track arbitration. So the keyword is fast track, right? So um, the due process issue usually uh, arose in a couple of uh, ways. Um, the first is um, one of the questions people typically ask is whether or not, given the short time frame, the arbitrators are required to um, apply a more heightened standard or duty to oversee the proceedings, right? And I don't know whether uh, you recall, but recently the Singapore High Court issued a decision, I think in 2011, called China Machine v. Japan Energy, which precisely there with a question because one of the parties involved uh, that lost the arbitration that was in ICC arbitration in Singapore under the expedited procedure, uh, challenged the award on the grounds that, well, the, the arbitrator didn't do a job properly 
to follow the strict procedure that the parties themselves agree. So the issue for the court was, uh, do the arbitrators owe a high duty given the fast track nature? And they could say no. They could point out the fact that the parties willfully agree to this procedure, knowingly that, you know, knowing how a complex this the contract and issue was, so they have to abide by that. There's no special um, heightened duty by the tribunal. The second aspect uh, of due process that usually arise in this uh, expedite procedure is the, as you may know, um, uh, the arbitrator has the ability to uh, order the final hearing to be conducted just through documentary evidence without any in-person hearing. And that is a very uh, uh, particular characteristic of the expedite procedure. And, um, and again, I mean, I, I'm sure the, some, some of the losing party might raise that as a potential challenge, but I want to point out the fact that under the SIC rules, SIC rule, um, the uh, arbitrator has the power to do so, right? But after consultation of the parties, so as a practical tips from the arbitrator standpoint, I mean, as long as the arbitrator gives the parties a chance to, to, uh, to, to, to make its case, and then he or she can proceed to make a ruling in that regard. So I, I yield my uh, rest of my time to my, my colleague Min to, to follow up on this uh, question. Thanks, thanks, Luan. Um, you, you, you know, the expedited procedure um, rules uh, came into being when, when I was at the SIEC and, uh, and I had a hand in drafting the original um, uh, you, you know, rules, rules for this. And uh, it, it wasn't easy. I mean, we, we took a lot of um, uh, points uh, on board from, from practitioners because six months is really a very challenging time frame. And uh, ha having now, you know, uh, left, the, left the SIEC a while ago and, and, and sitting now as arbitrator in expedited procedure hearing, I'm experiencing for myself the, uh, the, the challenges of trying to keep the timelines while ensuring, you know, due, due process because uh, Luan is absolutely right. Um, you know, especially if you are going to be the losing party, if you're the losing party, uh, and particularly if you're a, a losing respondent, uh, these, these are, this is a point that, that, that comes up. So we have to be very careful uh, as, as a tribunal when, when you hear uh, expedited procedure hearings. And, and really, although, although the rules specifically say that you may, you may abbreviate timelines, um, it is, it, it's a balance, right? Um, and, and in one recent case that I've, I've uh, set in, uh, there were a number of interlocutory applications that came up in the course of um, that, uh, that, that case. And, and then you are faced with this uh, question whether you're going to be able to complete things on time. Um, but one, one thing that the SIAC had been helpful with uh, uh, but in, in, in that particular matter for, for me and uh, in other matters as well, because I went back to SIAC and said, look, uh, are there ways to, you know, is, is there a possibility of a, an extension of time uh, beyond the six months? Um, and and while, while I tried to keep, you know, to, to, to the six months, uh, in the end, I did, I, did, I did require a short extension by, by two weeks in order to, in order to complete the, um, the, 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 the award uh, as, you know, the, the hearing didn't take place as originally planned and had to be delayed by, by a little bit. So, so it, it, is, it is a balancing, I, I would say it's really a, a, a balancing act between trying to ensure due process. And I think the tribunal has to be uh, uh, mindful that um, should, should there be a, 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 a need, you know, in order to do justice, you, you may have to uh, seek a uh, time extension or even move the uh, expedited procedure out of uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the fast track. And, and I think that's the question at the, at the end. But uh, uh, that, that to me, uh, the, main, the main point, I think, is really to ensure that uh, you, 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 do have to, uh, you do have to try to balance as, as best you can. So I should point out very quickly, Edmund, uh, very quickly that there are safety valves in the rules, right? Uh, uh, there is a possibility to extend the six month deadline in exceptional circumstances, number one. And number two, if the case become like too big or too large or for whatever other exceptional reason, uh, uh, there's a possibility to convert the proceeding into a regular arbitration. So that's also available. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, those those are exactly the two two safety valves that uh, we had uh, you know put in place in the rules uh, from the beginning. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Min and Luan. Um, what you highlighted just now is actually quite interesting because uh, there is uh, I think quite a few of us have experienced the situation where um, uh, 
the parties want an expedited procedure. They want to finish it within six months, but they also want to do interlocutory applications, make uh, 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 requests for, for document production, get all that done in the six months. So it can get a little bit challenging, but I'm not here to tell you the answer because uh, PISUT and, and SITPA are about to explain their views and explain their tactics for keeping within those six months, despite whatever the parties want to do. So if I could hand it over to Pisut, can you tell us about the general timelines for an expedited procedure case so that you can still get to the award in six months, but give the parties what they want? Yeah, thank, thanks, Esmond. Um, uh, first, um, I, I want to point out that um, the expedited procedures under SIAC rule is not, uh, does not apply automatically. Uh, it will apply only if um, uh, one of the parties apply for it. Uh, it is uh, not like um, um, expedited procedures under uh, uh, other rules like um, ICC or THAC, where the expedited procedures can be applied automatically if, if the amount of claim uh, fall below the, the, the limited um, dispute amount threshold. Uh, for the uh, for the uh, expedited procedures under uh, SIAC rules uh, to apply, um, it, it first start with applications for uh, EP for for expedited procedures, uh, um, and the 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 rules provide that um, the expedited procedure has to be applied before the constitution of the tribunal. Um, the register uh, uh, will be the the uh, the. The person who, to whom the party to, to, to whom the applicant um, um, shall make the application, and because the application is not ex parte, uh, the party who apply for the EP um, um, must also make a copy to the opposite party, and notify the the register when they they did so. Um, after receiving the application, the register will uh, then provide the other party an opportunity to, uh, um, to file an op opposition to, um, um, to the EP application. And in practice, uh, um, this will be uh, the, the time period provided for uh, objection. It is um, um, approximately 14 days. And after that, um, the, applic uh, the applicant will, will be given the opportunity uh, to respond to an objection within seven days. Um, once, the uh, once the application and um, you know, the objection, if any, uh, um, is submitted, um, the, it, it will be the power of the SIAC presidents uh, to consider and to determine uh, whether uh, the application meets criteria set out under rules 5.1. Um, and even if um, the application shows and meets the criteria uh, set out under rule 5.1, um, it is still under discretion of the SIAC presidents to consider whether, whether the case um, has complexity uh, in the dispute or um, um, the, the quantum of um, claim involved um, is sufficient or, or suitable for the uh, for the president to uh, you know to grant uh, the expedited procedure uh, once the the president's determined uh, that it is suitable um, uh, and the uh, uh, ep uh, should be granted um, then um, rules number 5 of um, siac will be applied and that means um, uh, the default of number of uh, arbitrator will be the sole arbitrator. After the constitution of the sole arbitrator, um, um, this is the, the, the moment uh, that the six months limit uh, time period um, will, be, uh, will, will have to be achieved by the tribunal. Um, as a tribunal, um, um, e even if, even if um, uh, the rules provide that the, uh, you have six months uh, before the final award to be um, um, uh, to be made, um, it has to. Uh, we, we have to take into account that um, the tribunal will have to. Uh, we have to spend time, uh, spare time for for them to uh, for him or her to prepare the draft award, and um, um, they have to provide ample time for the SIAC registrar to review or to scrutinize the draft award before the award can be before the final award can be uh, you know, assigned and issued to the parties. 
so that means um, the tribunal has to manage um, the six month period for um, you know, um, conducting the preliminary hearings, uh, pre preliminary meeting um, with the parties to determine whether uh, a hearing of witness, a hearing of expert witness are necessary. Um, if I were, uh, you know, the tribunal, I, I may have to ensure that um, if the hearing is to be granted, um, it has to be conducted within um, a very um, short time period. And, and in a typical EP um, expedited procedures a hearing, a hearing of witness, if any, uh, will be um, 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 complete within a period between one to three days. And, um, you know, um, Uh, I think practically, from, from practical point of view, um, the, the, the tribunal has to manage and ensure that um, uh, the proceeding will be closed um, within uh, four or 4.5 months after the constitution of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the tribunal. Um, I, I will leave the remaining um, uh, point for Sipa to, to Chimin. Sipa, uh, your, your turn. Thank you. So I usually work backwards. So we have six months and um, I usually allow a, a month for the review process by SIAC. So my draft award should be done in five months. And I take into account that I probably need two to three weeks to write my award, depending on my schedule, looking ahead, and also the complexity based on summary of the claim um, and the defense or counterclaim. So really, the parties are looking at having their hearing, if at all there's a hearing, completed within four months. So that is 16 weeks that the parties are working with when they choose to come in, as correctly pointed out by Christian. After all, it's an opt-in. They've chosen to, and the president has considered it appropriate. So within that 16 weeks, everything is done. I my, my style is to lock in at the first um, or preliminary meeting, a tentative hearing day. So we know that's our end mark. Um, usually two days tentatively fixed, and then if we need to vacate it because there's no need for it, and we might determine it after consulting further. Um, but the locking dates are there for the hearing for two days. Perhaps a standby for a third day. So within that uh, 16 weeks, as I said, uh, many things need to be done. So uh, in determining at that stage how much time is given, I would usually ask uh, whether parties anticipate interlocutory applications and whether they anticipate expert evidence, because that would determine how much time they get for their pleadings. So if they don't anticipate interlocutories um, and no experts, then I would normally give two weeks for each set of pleadings. So that will, you know, with the defense counterclaim, Apply and defense counterclaim to be joined up. Eight weeks would go with that. I usually allow for specific requests for discovery one week to request, mutually request, one week to object, mutually object, one week to write to the tribunal, apply to tribunal. And so that takes care of another four weeks. And then the remaining um, four weeks or so would be on submissions, uh, uh, sorry, would be on witness statements, reply witness statements, opening submissions, and then on the, on the fourth month, we are at the hearing and then closing submissions within a week. That gives me two, three weeks to write my award. Uh, and SIC has um, you know, ample time, four weeks to consider whatever comments they have. Um, if experts are anticipated, then the timelines are truncated a little. Uh, pleadings instead of two weeks, we have to be done in 10 days. Request for documents instead of one week each, we have to be done within four days. So that gives me another four weeks to play around with that exchange of expert report. And as um, uh, Ron and Min have said, this comes to the worst. If we are pushed, then we would ask, or the parties would ask, usually, for an extended um, extension of the six months deadline, uh, and maybe by a few weeks or a month or so. But it is, I've done many of them, both as a presiding and as so, and I, I find that it, it is achievable. And usually, an extension of time uh, is granted. Uh, based on very uh, sound grounds in my party. That would be my take on managing the time, uh, Edmund. Thank you, Sipa. Thank you, Pisut. Um, I was going to ask a, a bit of a follow-up question on that. Um, the timelines that you have just specified, for example, Sipa, are actually uh, 
quite compressed. And uh, what if a party says, oh, you know, oh, you don't need one month uh, for the SIEC to review. Um, or I think you can draft your award within two weeks. Um, and uh, we, um, we want more time to, to do document production. Um, we uh, need more time. And, and, and this sometimes comes out from the uh, respondent. Or the claimant uh, is ready with the case, obviously. They've been preparing for the case. Now I'm at the receiving end and I have to rush like crazy to meet the timings. I mean, how do you, how do you as the tribunal manage a situation like that? Uh, Pisut Sipa, uh, either one of you first. So, yeah. oh, Sipa, you first, you first, you first. Yeah, right. So actually, I would expect that to happen more, but it actually doesn't happen very much. I think once people are locked into an expedited procedure, and I keep repeating that, you know, the award has to come out in that six months, uh, SIC has to have a period of review. That's what you subscribe for when you uh, when you locked into the SIAC rule, and therefore that's party autonomy. You chose that, and it has been decided according to the rules you have chosen. And therefore, there is no um, give as to SIAC's time. I may give in a bit more. I may say, all right, given the circumstances, I am prepared to rush it uh, and award, but I need a minimum of two weeks. Um, and so, if and that has happened, the only time they've done that is when we couldn't get common dates. For a, uh, for a hearing and therefore I said fine I allow um, a, a tentative date we have a tentative date within the four months we will push another date uh, in five months but it's subject to you getting an extension from the uh, registrar if the registrar of the SIC gives you that extension very well otherwise we are keeping to the timelines and you will have to find counsel uh, to accommodate that that's yeah, from, from yeah, from from my point of view, I think um, we, we we have to go back to uh, the basic of um, expedited procedures. Uh, before the expedited uh, procedures uh, is granted, um, it has to pass the consideration of the SIAC precedents. And if granted, it means that uh, it it is likely that the complexity of the dispute is not that much complex, and um, um, it is also likely that. Uh, um, there is a uh, low amount of evidence or volume of evidence or, or, or uh, dispute issues. So um, as, as a tribunal, um, it is um, likely that the tribunal is also able to uh, you know, uh, complete um, the, draft, uh, uh, the draft award uh, within you know, uh, three weeks or, or maybe top of one month um, uh, after the, 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 the completion of um, the hearing um, or even before. Uh, so if, if I were the tribunal uh, in an, an EP um, uh, procedures, um, I would consider uh, this point as well, as well um, uh, to balance the request of the party to, uh, to, uh, to, you know, to have full opportunity to present that case uh, uh, versus um, you know, the need for expedited proceedings uh, under the, the, the EP. Um, so if, if I can foresee that uh, due to the complexity of the, the dispute, uh, which is low complexity, uh, I can uh, finish my uh, drafting in a shorter time period, like in two weeks, as um, um, requested by the respondents, I will grant um, uh, the respondents request. But in, uh, after all, um, uh, we have to ensure, as a tribunal, we have to ensure that um, the proceedings and the final award is rendered within six months time period. Thank you, both of you. Uh, Loan or Min or uh, Jita, do you have any comments on uh, uh, how to manage that six months time period? Anyone wants to chime in? I'll go first. Um, I think uh, where things can first. get... Um, <laughs> yeah, where, thanks, Edmund. Thanks, Loan. I think where things can get a bit um, elongated is when you have a an absent respondent because then you have almost that additional duty to make sure that they're given every opportunity uh, to respond and that can add time especially if you need to make sure that you know the documents are served personally and you get the claimant to confirm that every single piece of correspondence and every single piece of filing has been sent to the respondent and there's proper proof for it and you 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 more often than not, as an arbitrator, you want to make sure that you give them multiple opportunities to come back before you say, all right, that's enough, I've done uh, my duty. So in that, 
that situation, I could see how sometimes the six months uh, time period can, can, can get a bit more difficult. Uh, but again, because if we go back to the basics of um, getting an extension of time in exceptional circumstances, that could be one of the reasons in, in, in getting that extension, Edmund. Thank you. Uh, Min? I think you want yeah, to say Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I, I think, um, you know, having an absent respondent, it does make things, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it, does, it does place a, a burden on you to ensure that uh, due process is uh, properly uh, observed and, and that every opportunity is given and, and, and that, you know, time, time is given, uh, uh, every chance is given for the respondent to respond, uh, even if they don't want to. Um, but I, I find that the, the challenge with expedited procedure um, uh, really comes in, in trying to manage parties uh, as, as they file uh, you know, interlocutory applications and as uh, new issues come up in, in the course of the, the, the matter. Uh, and, and that's where I think the arbitrator has to, uh, has to try to manage. And, and, and six months really uh, uh, doesn't give you a lot of time. So you, you have to, I think, be quite... Uh, firm at the same time, uh, uh, making sure that both sides are given the opportunity to be heard uh, as, as much as possible. Because, uh, and, and, and of course, you know, from the, from the perspective of the, 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 the mechanism as well and, and, and process, right? Uh, if in every other matter uh, where the expedited procedure is being employed, uh, the, the tribunal goes and asks for a, uh, an extension of time for the SIC, then it, is, it becomes no longer exceptional. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the basis of, I think Bisa was, uh, was saying, uh, you know, what's the basis of expedited procedure, right? You know, then, you know, that, that comes into question. So, so I think it is incumbent on tribunals uh, and, and it is, it is an, a tough job to try to, uh, to, to, to balance um, the, the, the need for process as well as, uh, you know, to ensure that uh, parties' interests are, uh, are, are, are there, right, for, 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 from both sides. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, would you like anything to add? Yeah, I, I agree. Obviously, due process is very important, right? Because you want to preserve the, uh, you want to make sure to protect their work. But I think that uh, as a practical matter, one of the complaints that people hear a lot about the arbitration process is what they call, quote unquote, the due process paranoia, <laughs> um, uh, which is basically uh, referred to the Arbitrators being super, super cautious in, you know, trying to comply with, you know, due process, bend over backwards to, to make sure that everyone is fair and, and things like that. And I think that um, we should, again, I mean, look at the, um, the approach taken by the Singapore High Court and other courts uh, that take a fairly commercial approach to this, you know, expedite procedure where they recognize, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, the policy willingly accept to to be uh, to to abide by this very fast track procedure with you know obviously less you know right and you know than a normal arbitration, um, so I think we have to we as an arbitrator we have to be mindful of that right. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a fine line between these two issues, but I think that um, a lot of arbitrators personally um, uh, err too much on the side of caution, uh, you know, because it's a practical matter the the number of awards that got reversed on. Um, New process grounds are fairly, you know, uh, fairly minimal uh, in in the major jurisdictions. You know, and we're talking about really egregious matters. Um, but again, as long as you give the parties a chance to to be heard, then I think you have the better ability to protect their work. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to throw a spanner in the works right now uh, on this point. What if the respondent says, you, you need to give me a little bit more time than the claimant because the claimant's been ready for the longest time Claimant knew this was, you know, likely to be an expedited arbitration. He's got his uh, witnesses lined up. He's got his uh, submissions lined up. He's got his documents lined up. I'm scrambling. Um, so I need a bit more time in the timetable. Uh, would you grant the respondent more time? And I'm going to ask other people this as well. Um, I think it's a case by case. Also, it all depends on, you know, is a legitimate uh, uh, request or not? Because in all arbitration, that's how it is, right? I mean, the, 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 the claimant by its nature has more time to prepare the claims, you know, and everyone has to abide by the same, you know, rules. Uh, but I guess, I mean, there might be exceptional circumstances, but it's not a, 
it's not an automatic thing that you know you respond and you get more time to prepare. No, I don't think so. Do the others agree with that? Let's uh, let's go around the table. Ajita. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, uh, Pisut. Yeah. Uh, I, we have to look at uh, the specific um, reasons uh, by the respondents um, um, why, why they should be given um, extra more time than the claimant and, and, and decide on a case by case basis. Min, do you think it's, 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 uh, it's, uh, if you decide to give one more week to the respondent, is there going to be a problem? I, 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 I agree with Luan. I mean, you know, in, in, every, whether it's ex in every case, whether it's ex expedited or not, uh, you know. Uh, you, you, always, you are going to be faced with that same uh, reason. So, so in general, I mean, unless there is really exceptional um, uh, ground, I, I wouldn't uh, give time. Just because, you know, the claimant <laughs> was ready first. Uh, thanks, Min. Sitpa? Yeah, I, well, I, two things really. One is the need for equal treatment. And the other is actually council are very sensible. And they usually come up with their own timetable. Uh, and at first instance, it might be equal. We've got grant equal time to each. And then if the respondent comes back to say, for such and such a reason, can I have an extension of time? Then it will be treated as an extension of time subject to objections. But on the face of it, I would prefer to give equal treatment at the outset and then take it on a case by case on an extension. And on the earlier point, can I also say, if it's particularly com uh, complex, parties have the option of writing to the registrar writing to the tribunal and take it off uh, EP altogether. Thank you. Thank you all for some really uh, illuminating answers there. Now, let's get to the hearing. So we, we have uh, gone through the procedure. We've got to the hearing. Uh, the hearing is fixed for, uh, let's say, three days. Um, and so how does the tribunal manage the hearing? Does the tribunal use a chess clock? method uh, for each side, keep very close track of uh, how many minutes or hours is spent by each side, so each side uh, has uh, a fair shot during the hearing. Uh, do you limit the number of witnesses at the hearing? Because if, let's say, one side wants to call six witnesses and the other side wants to call ten, uh, good luck if you're trying to finish in three days. So, so what do you do? And those di very difficult questions, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to pose to Jita. Thanks, Edmund. I think if we take a step back, um, the question is actually about balancing two potentially competing needs, right? You need to conduct the hearing expeditiously, but you also need to preserve procedural fairness and equal opportunity for parties to present their respective cases. So personally, um, as counsel and as an arbitrator, I am a fan of, of the chess clock method um, that you just mentioned, because in most cases, and I stress most cases, and I'll come back to that. In most cases, it, it does it's the job of balancing those two sometimes competing needs. Well, it leaves um, each party to manage how they wish to use the time that's allocated to them. And, and that, that may mean they need to decide and, and then who to prioritize in terms of witness examination and, and how long do they want to dedicate to their opening. Now, I said earlier in most cases, and I do agree with you that there could be a situation where you have an imbalance in the number of witnesses. So one side, like you said, may be presenting six witnesses and then the other side is presenting 10 witnesses. So would chess clock method be fair in that situation? It may not be. Uh, or even if it's considered fair, it may not be efficient because one side could potentially just end up using the time uh, and run it down and, and cross-examine a witness for the sake of cross-examining. Um, so in that situation, I think as an arbitrator, it's incumbent on you to always ask the ultimate question, which is what is fair and what is efficient in all the circumstances. And unfortunately, there are no easy answers. Uh, as an arbitrator, you hope and you want to counsel to be reasonable about it and agree amongst themselves as to how best to allocate the, the, the whole duration of the hearing fairly and efficiently. I think that's what SIPA meant. I've been quite lucky that I've got uh, cases, assigned cases to me where counsel has been quite sensible about these things. So they could agree that you know, each side will have an equal amount of time for their opening and for their closing. And then they may decide that they'll have an equal amount of time for each witness. But that ends up uh, where one side will have more time because that one side will have to examine more witnesses. But if it's agreed, then that's not an issue uh, that, that can arise later on. The problem is what happens when you have counsel um, for, uh, for both sides unable to agree. So in that case, I think as an arbitrator, you probably have to be more hands-on and start having the, the, the hearing, the case management conference as, as the forum where you quiz the parties on how long do they actually need 
uh, to spend on each witness and why, and that might force them to think about the case. You know, sometimes as lawyers, we also have that tendency of, I don't know, I haven't planned it, so I'm just going to assume the worst case scenario and ask for the maximum amount of time. I think if you have a good case management early, because you would see, right, from the number of filings done as to what kind of issues will arise, uh, and the moment you have that imbalance in the number of witnesses right at the last filing, that's when you probably have to start deciding to have an earlier case management uh, conference so that you can flush out all these issues and try to get parties to first agree. So if they're still any, if they can't agree and you start quizzing them, it's a good avenue as well. I find the case management conference to remind counsel to behave reasonably. Otherwise, um, they'll have cost issues to contend with. Um, obviously, the tribunal can use unreasonable behavior or time-wasting behavior as a factor when deciding on costs. And, and, and that might make counsel think twice because they don't want to have to justify to their client why they may lose their costs, even though they've won the case. Um, so that, that's how I would see you manage all these competing interests. Personally, I've not come across a case where you use limit, uh, the tool of limiting the number of witnesses to manage the timeline. Uh, because I think there's always a danger that, uh, that you know, it could affect due process. Every party has the right to present their case fully and in a manner that they deem fit. So once you start limiting witnesses, you run into issues of what do you do in terms of admissibility of the evidence of the witness being excluded? Or if you then end up admitting the statement, uh, what do you do in terms of assigning weight if uh, the evidence hasn't been tested? So I think it's, it's a bit harder to use that as a, as a time management tool. Uh, I mean, others may have a different view, but that that's how I see it. Like, if anything, starting point is chess clock. If that doesn't work, then you need to come up with a different uh, way of, of using the time efficiently. Thanks, Ajita. Uh, do any of you have additional points to make on how to run the hearing in terms of the witnesses and chess clocks and things like that? Or has Ajita uh, given the full lecture? I think I, um, I definitely favor the chess clock, right? Um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the elements of the um, due process is, you know, treating the parties equally. And I think there's no greater equalizer than a chess clock, you know, each of, each of party has, you know, the same amount of time. Uh, it can decide to put on 10 witnesses within that time frame or two witnesses. It's their choice, you know. So, so, so that I think definitely in favor of a chess clock. Thank you, Luan. Um, all right, so let's say, uh, as you know, arbitrations can, in some situations, be decided on the basis of the documents alone. Um, what would your considerations be in deciding an arbitration on the basis of the documents alone without a hearing? Um, are there any concerns with doing that? And... Uh, what would you practically need to do as the tribunal in order to achieve a documents only uh, arbitration? Maybe I can throw this over to Gita, uh, Gita first uh, and then uh, ask anybody else if they would like to come in. Gita. Yeah, that's always a tough one, right? I mean, leaving aside the bit where the expedited procedure rule says that you have to consult with the parties, but like putting that aside first as an arbitrator, I think the first question you ask yourself or at least what I ask myself, is whether the, the, the issues in dispute can be answered by the documents on record without having a hearing. If the answer is yes, then perhaps you may not need to have a hearing and, 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 and you can proceed with writing your award on that basis. But it, it, you know, what, there are cases where you want to have a hearing uh, and it's in the interest of the parties to have a hearing and that tend to be cases where um, it involves not just issues of law but actually extensive uh, dispute on the facts and especially when the as issues like fraud or deceit being alleged and a lot hang on credibility of the witness. Uh, the other one where I feel a hearing might be required is where there is an absence or a dearth of contemporaneous um, evidence and what you're left with is actually two different versions of what happened by two witnesses. Then the only way you can test it when you don't have contemporaneous evidence is to hear the two witnesses and, and you know, have them examined. Um, the other one where that you know, the hearing might be appropriate is when a big chunk of the case turns on expert evidence. And again, it, because expert evidence essentially is opinion evidence, right? You're relying on a professional opinion of someone who's, uh, who's, who's got expertise on a particular technical issue. And if you have then two different experts, you may want to test it because 
most 99% of the time, they're both equally credible, but they, they have come to different viewpoints and that's why you end up having a dispute. And in that situation, a hearing might serve all parties and, and, and the tribunal well. So those are some of the things that, that I've considered before, Edmund. Uh, thank you, Jita. You know, 5.2, Rule 5.2C of the SIC rule says, the tribunal may, in consultation with the parties, decide if the dispute is to be decided on the basis of documentary evidence only or if a hearing is required mm -hmm. uh, for the examination of any witness and expert witness as well as for oral argument. So in consultation with the parties. Um, what are your views on, on what would constitute consultation with the parties? Um, a meeting, uh, correspondence, email, actual sessions? Correspondence can be sufficient. Typically, you ask about it early on, uh, you know, when you have your first case management conference. And sometimes, if parties are not sure yet, they'll park it and they'll say, right, we'll just reserve one or two days, for example. And then you can revisit the issue again as matters progress. Uh, so yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to be a meeting. Uh, you can have it by way of correspondence and, and checking in for the party's viewpoints. I don't know if others have a different experience on, on this one. Anybody else? If the parties are in agreement, then it's very straightforward. We would you know, exchange correspondence, it's a done deal, it's documents only. Um, and if they both think that there's always, one of them thinks there's a need for a hearing, then I would uh, usually call for a, a, a meeting a, a, from, by, the, by the phone, really, to find out what it is that they, they want to have the hearing for, what kind of witnesses, uh, and in hearing that, then I would determine whether or not there's a real need to have all the evidence. And look, we come to expedited uh, procedure thinking, oh my goodness, six months is, is very short, we need to do all these things. But really, there have been filters put in place. The president has already filtered and only determined that suitable uh, cases which are less complex, where the quantum is not disproportionate to you know, the, 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 the response, uh, should be allowed for expedited procedures. So with that check and balance, I think uh, I tend to give at least a day, if not two days of hearing, when one party makes a sufficient uh, case to have some formal evidence in. So documents only if both parties are really in agreement on it. Uh, Luan, yeah. You know, in deciding whether you should conduct the case on the basis of documentary evidence or not, Another thing that I look at is whether or not my witnesses are credible. Right? Um, I mean, if you have witnesses who unfortunately are not that credible or just don't come across well, especially compared to the other side's witnesses, then you might want to think twice about putting them on the stand. Thank you, Luan. Okay, I think we, we better move on to the next topic, which is drafting the award. So um, how does one draft an enforceable summary award uh, under Rule 5.2e of the SIAC rules? Uh, it's still got to be an award. It still has to be a reasoned award unless the parties agree otherwise. Uh, so how does one effectively do this on a practical basis? Um, basically achieving completeness in brevity. So um, could I please uh, ask Luan and, and Sitpa to answer that question? You know, very quickly, I think you mentioned the keyword, admin, that the award has to be reason, right? It has to be a reason award because, I mean, under the SIAC rules, for any award, including an award under the expedited procedure, it has to be reason award, right? The mere fact that you can, under the expedited procedure, um, an arbitrator can issue an award, a reason award in summary form, uh, actually in some time can potentially be problematic because you know sometimes it's actually harder to write shorter than longer because us lawyers we tend to write longer i, I recall as a say by i think mark twain he said that something to the to the effect that i apologize to having to write the short letter uh this long letter because i didn't have time to write a short letter so i mean sometimes it could be a challenge to do a shorter a shorter form uh but all oh, joking aside i think that uh when you write a word, you have to, uh, even in a, in, in, a, in a summary form, you have to understand, I mean, this, this applies to all our words, um, who your targeted audience is. I mean, I, generally there are like four audience, I think. First, you, you, you want to write to the losing party. You want to make sure 
you want to make sure to explain to losing part of that you have duly considered their arguments and that you know you issue your opinion in good faith and correctly and fairly. Um, and for the winning party, you want to make sure that you know the award is clear, easy to understand, and easy to enforce, right? Uh, and to the enforcement authorities or the local courts who's going to enforce their work, uh, again, you want to have you want to clearly record the rights and obligations of the party so that they can know what to enforce, right? Uh, also, I think it's important to reflect in the award, uh, have a fair discussion, uh, discussion about why due process was satisfied in this case, right? That's very important. Um, and lastly, for the arbitral institution like SIAC, um, you need to make sure that you comply with a particular style or format that is required. So those are the things I know applies to every single um, award, but I think in the context of where you have less time, uh, it's always important to remind and understand and remember. Now, these are the things you need to, to hit, you know, even in the summary form. And lastly, like Steve, I think Sipa has said earlier, you need to account for time to do a draft, re draft award and give us enough time for the SAC to review and then so you can meet the six month deadline. That is very important. We don't have the luxury of time like in a normal circumstances. Uh, Sipa? So I, I will uh, echo a couple of things that uh, uh, Ron has said, which is finally my job is to provide an enforceable award. So my eye is always on that ball. Uh, the reasons would be that I've never given um, uh, an award that's without a reason of some kind. Um, and it's always for the losing party, really. Um, and our fees don't change just because it's an expedited uh, procedure. Therefore, my commitment remains the same. And I get a lot of help along the way. Council to me have always been cooperative. And again, the filter by the president has helped. Uh, but what I think the tribunal can do to assist, and I use that, is to ask for agreed uh, issues to be put forward together by both parties and vetted by the tribunal. So we keep the, the, the reign very tight as to what are the core issues that are require determination. And you don't have runaway 57 issues for determination to be dealt with in the award. So once that is there already at the level playing field, when it comes to uh, the content of the award itself, what is most important that is that the, the award records the natural justice process and that equal treatment has been afforded to the parties. And so the procedural history, to me, still, still remains very important. It may be brief, but it must record the opportunities given to the party. Uh, I also find it useful to outline the um, undisputed facts. Uh, and so that narrows, again, the ambit of potential challenge later on. And again, the issues that require my determination plucked out from what the parties have already done with me. And then succinctly, deal with these issues and just fall in on the, the, the defining evidence and that's it. So that gives me the natural justice in one award together with the gravity that is required for the expert process. Thank you, Luan and Sipa. Um, there's a question that's come in and uh, I'm just going to insert it right now. As an arbitrator, do you think it's necessary to have scrutiny by the centre? Do you prefer to have it? Or does it slow down your, uh, does it eat into your time, your six month timing? I can give a stab at that if you would like me to. All right, Sipa then Min. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, okay. Min, no, after you. No, 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 Sipa, go ahead. I, 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 I of course, you know, uh, may have a slightly subjective opinion. <laughs> Okay, he's yielded so, the floor to Sipa. All right. So, I, I, well, as compared to ICC, ICC does away with uh, the scrutiny for purposes of uh, an expedited procedure, and we still have it for purposes of SIC. I always find it useful, and I, I think they make um, a, a great attempt to do it very quickly. I always like this um, uh, safety net. That something I've missed out, the number of zeros or whatever I might have wrongly typed in, is picked up uh, by SIC, and they can tell me what cost, um, you know, that is my award on costs has gone you know, slightly astray, or whatever. So I always find it useful. Yeah, I think I agree with Sipa that I am a fan and I think it's necessary and important too because even though it's an expedited procedure, it is still ultimately an SIEC award. So, so they need to make sure that it, you know, it meets the, basically the quality and standard of any other SIEC award. It's, it's not a different 
award. And in that sense, it's useful both for parties as well as um, for the arbitrator. So I, I'll, I'll just add, uh, add that, um, you know, the, the, the purpose of scrutiny really is to ensure that, you know, the, the enforceability of the award is um, uh, ensured, right? Uh, that, that you have the best chance of it uh, being enforced and, and to make sure that um, you know, arbitrators have not uh, missed out on anything. And it's, it's especially important uh, in an expedited procedure award. Uh, you know, when, when I was at the SIAC, uh, we, we felt, and, 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 and I think uh, the SIAC still does that, you know, uh, com you, you might think that, you know, because it's expedited, maybe you don't need to spend as much time scrutinizing it or, or that, um, uh, you know, not, not the same amount of attention needs to be given to it uh, and, and, and time. But actually, it's, it could be the opposite uh, because uh, the, the process does allow for a summary form award, right? Um, and, and so you need to ensure that um, where, where the award comes in, 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 in summary form especially, that the award is, um, uh, is fully compliant uh, for enforceability purposes uh, with the requirements of the convention uh, and, and, and also that you know, it is fully reasoned uh, and, and yet concise. Uh, and, and, and so those are things that the, the, the scrutiny can, can help with. So I, I, I'm of course a fan. <laughs> yes, uh, I think we, we, we should add, add in here that um, uh, the scrutiny of award by the SIAC is not in relation to the merit or the decision made by the, the, the tribunal. Um, the, the SIAC only scrutinize in terms of form, format of the award and the completeness of the award. Like um, uh, many people say, uh, they, they, they need to ensure that the award is complete and um, um, should not be, uh, 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 there should not be any technical errors in the award when it comes to an enforcement phase. So I also um, um, prefer uh, somebody to you know, review the draft award to ensure that um, um, the award made by me is uh, you know, enforceable in the future. Thank you, Pisut. And I, I think you just want to highlight the, the six-month timing. Uh, well, what we just discussed is really important because the six-month timing um, includes the time for scrutiny. The six months only runs out when the award actually gets to uh, the parties. Yes. Right. So one yes. really does have to factor in this very useful scrutiny process into the entire six months. Um, right. So let's uh, now talk about uh, the last topic that I'm proposing to deal with, which is, let's say uh, you as the tribunal have issues as to whether this case really should be uh, an expedited procedure case. Um, should you know you you beginning to look at the issues? You're beginning beginning to look at the number of witnesses um, and the amount of evidence, and you feel this is not an expedited procedure case. What factors would you identify? I've just identified some possible ones, but what factors? If I could uh, ask Min to take the lead on this and others to chime in, what factors would you identify as um, important for considering whether to carry on with the expedited procedure? in your capacity as tribunal or, or to, to try and get this off the expedited procedure track? Thanks, thanks Edmund. I, well, I mean, 5.4 basically says that upon application by a party, the tribunal may consider this. And, and, and of course, you know, um, the tribunal would, should, should, should consult the parties on, uh, on both sides, right? Uh, whether, whether that is something that, um, uh, that there's a course of action that the, the, the matter should take. Um, the the big the, the, the main thing I think would be the complexity of the of the matter, right? Uh, I mean, you you may think, right? I mean, I, I had an expedited procedure uh, uh, case recently where the both sides agreed, you know, at the preliminary hearing that uh, this is something that can be uh, disposed of quite quickly. Uh, it's a simple matter, uh, that, and that's why they were both agreeable to having it on an expedited basis. Um, but subsequently, I mean, uh, it, it became uh, um, it became clear that there, there were more complex issues to be to be dealt with. Um, but since you know, no no one uh, and to me, uh, it may not have been the most appropriate uh, matter to have been decided by by the expedited procedure rule. But since nobody uh, applied for it <laughs> to be put on the normal track, uh, I mean, we we, we soldiered on, and and uh, I, I I did have to seek an extension of time because you know there there were. There were applications that, that were made uh, for, for documents, uh, etc. 
Um, so I think I think complexity would be would be the key issue, um, and and typically, uh, I, I would expect that um, uh, an an expedited procedure case uh, uh, would application would be made by the claimant um, because you know cost savings, time savings, etc. Uh, and if if the claimant feels that it should no longer be on the expedited track, then I I would think that you know, there there must be quite good reasons for 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 them not to not to want that. Um, but uh, I, I think complexity would be, would be the case, and and, and and the contentiousness of the um, of the matter, uh, the interlocks, uh, the, the the number of interlocks uh, uh, implications. Thank you, Min. Um, does anybody else have anything to add to that? Uh, I one, yeah. You have to be mindful um, that a party is not using this, you know, this ability to you know to 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 get out of expanded procedure to delay the proceedings further right um because i think a question you should ask for is is whether or not um these are facts that just came up you know or unexpected or unforeseen right because the party were in the proceeding in the first place as you know uh expedited procedure for for a reason in the first place and um so i think you have to be mindful of that you know that that gamemanship by one of the parties as a potential possibility Thank you. Um, Jita, Sitpa, Pisut, anything to add to that? No, nothing from me. Thank you. Um, no, sorry, was, Sitpa, you had something. Sorry, just to add a situation where we had asked uh, the tribunal and invited um, the claim to reconsider. Uh, it had, um, the president was moved to, to put the uh, claimant's dispute on an expedited procedure, um, but after that, an insolvency practitioner was appointed over the respondent, and therefore parties had been able to defer the whole um, compliance with procedural order and kept uh, seeking extensions of time for the issuance of the final award. And so the tribunal actually counted the claim and would you consider taking this off the EP uh, procedure? Uh, but they did not. So it's still going on on cycles of extensions of time. But one would think. Um, whether there might be a mechanism by which either SIEC or the tribunal then move for it to be removed from the process. Thanks, Ipa. Um, we have a couple of questions coming in and about five minutes left. So I encourage anyone who has a question to submit their questions using the Q&A function on the uh, Zoom platform. Um, the first question is, I understand Rule 5.2c of the SIC rules, but I want to know um, whether the tribunal can, after consulting parties, where one party doesn't agree for the dispute to be decided on the basis of documents alone, still go ahead to decide the uh, arbitration by documents uh, alone. If the tribunal does decide to do this, what kind of, uh, would this situation give the party objecting uh, an opportunity to challenge an award not in its favor? Does anybody want to handle that? I'll take a stab. Thanks, Jita. <laughs> no worries. So Rule 5.2c is slightly different from Rule 24, where you have a non-expedited procedure proceedings, uh, where the tribunal shall have a hearing if one party requests, whereas this one says the tribunal may decide not to have the hearing after consultation of parties. So on that basis alone, the, the straightforward answer is technically yes, the tribunal can still proceed to decide to have a documentary evidence uh, based only a decision uh, if it feels that the party's request for a party's request for hearings is not justified in the circumstances but i suspect practically speaking it'll be a brave arbitrator who will do that especially if a party applying to have a hearing have very good reasons typically you know i mean unless that party is just doing it to try to derail the process or delay matters typically a party requesting for a hearing will have good reasons and if if, if the application made is, is a reasoned one and, and that you know, uh, you, you want to be erring on the side of caution and have that hearing. Yeah, I think I'm just going to chime in myself on this. I think it's uh, a rather bold move to just yeah. go documents only, yeah. uh, generally. And I think most uh, tribunals would be very cautious before going documents only. And this, this rule about uh, consultation is uh, a topic that apparently has come up in Vietnam quite um, uh, recently. Um, and uh, 
I was just told this by uh, Nguyen Do yesterday, <clears throat> that in, in Vietnam, there's been a successful a challenge to enforcement on the basis of a lack of consultation before the tribunal went documents only, where the respondent didn't, uh, wasn't responding, didn't show up, and the tribunal issued emails uh, to say that, you know, I, I, I would like uh, your views on whether we should go documents only, but that was deemed insufficient consultation. So especially where you have a situation uh, in which the respondent is not showing up, um, that consultation requirement probably needs to be looked into a little bit more carefully and um, you really need to show that you've consulted in compliance with that rule so that you don't have problems with enforcement later on. Um, we're, we're two minutes out. I, I have a, a final question here. Um, since the, well, two questions now, you see, when you say you've got two minutes, you know, th that's when people start putting everything in. This is typical, uh, even where you have six months, everything just comes in at the end. Um, since the power of the tribunal to grant interim reliefs is so wide, which are generally the cases which require expedited procedures on the basis of exceptional urgency in a practical context? Wouldn't uh, urgent interim relief be the appropriate remedy in such cases, I, I suppose, as opposed to expedited procedure. Does anybody want to take a stab at that? I'm happy to just give my views Thanks on that. Well. If it's a urgent emergency um, uh, relief that re is required, then I think the expedited procedure six months later may not be the answer. If it's urgent, you want it now, then it will be either your emergency arbitrator uh, who should be right for, or your Fully constituted tribunal, you're near that, um, moved on, on, on the interim relief. I don't think um, EP is a procedure for that, but if you, I, I, I would think that it would be a situation where you need a conclusion quickly uh, and a final award on specific performance to be able to perform your other contractual obligations, maybe a better way to say in some exceptional circumstances and for the EP to be moved. Thank you very much, Sipa. Um, Unfortunately, well, we only have one question left, but we are, we're at 11 uh, a.m. and uh, we need to get on with the, the rest of a very, very packed schedule. So I'm exercising my powers of time management right now and saying uh, that's where we need to end. And I'm, I'm going to thank uh, the panelists very much for their wonderful contributions. Jita, Pisut, Luan, Sitpa and Min. Uh, thank you for listening to this session. And we are about to, I believe, head into the the next session where the SIEC uh, uh, Council will tell us their perspective. Thank you very much, Edmund. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.